And at some point in our journey, we think, maybe I'm not meant to be here. I want to be happy. I want to live forever. But here, there's always some problem. Here, everyone leaves, everything's temporary. Maybe I'm not meant for this world. Maybe I'm meant for another world. And so at that point, then the soul begins looking at what there may be beyond this world. Ancient scriptures actually are in the format of questions and answers, believe it or not. The Bhagavad Gita is questions and answers. And uh, many, many books are like that. Because when we ask questions, we always tend to go to a deeper level of understanding. In a beautiful assembly like this, you know, we may think, I don't have any questions. But then someone comes up with a question, and you think, that's a good question. I wonder what the answer to that is. So we learn so much and we try to go to a deeper level so we know how it relates. Krishna gives so many beautiful principles, so we'll try to draw on some of those. So perhaps you have a question about philosophy, about life and the bigger questions of why we're here. Maybe you have a question about practical stuff in life, relationships, the mind, um, diet. Maybe you have a question about the movement, the temple, the Hare Krishna tradition. And maybe you have a question about spiritual practice and what that relates to on a daily, daily basis for you. And uh, yeah, even if you want to ask any questions about what it means to be a monk, for example, then I'm happy to uh, refer you to Raj. <laughs> No, you can he's not a monk. He's an urban monk. <laughs> Go for it. Whoever would like to uh, ask a question. And I'm not going to pick. Whoever's got the mic, you have to decide who's... Please, please stand up if you're asking the question. Yeah, if you could stand up when you ask the question, that'd be great. Amazing. Well, the first thing I want to say is, shall we give a, ra a round of applause to all the mothers? <laughs> mothers are amazing. Um, mothers are incredible. You know, once they did a survey to try and find out how much it would cost to employ a mother. So they calculated all the jobs that a mother does. She's a cook, she's a driver, She's a counsellor, she's a nurse, um, she's a cleaner, she's a, you know, a teacher. And then, then they calculated how many hours the mother does, how many hours overtime. Um, the mother's always on call, even on holiday. And you know, they calculated how much it would cost to employ a mother, and you know how much it costs? Um, they calculated hundred and twenty two thousand pounds a year to employ a mum but it's more than that because it's done with love it's done with love you know even to this day when I go home and I see my mother as soon as she opens the door you know the first thing she tells me where's your laundry <laughs> she like she has to wash something so like if I go home without laundry it's like so sometimes I just have to go home with clean clothes and say, like, just wash these then, because I don't have any laundry. But the mother wants to serve. Srila Prabhupada actually said, the love between a mother and child is the purest type of love in this world. So the first thing I want to say to you is that just being a mother, that is spiritual. Because you're selfless. 
because you're giving and because you give them um, an opportunity to, for their future that they can do things, that they can achieve things, that they can go places. So don't ever think that being a mother is not a spiritual thing. Just, just taking care of your kids is part of your spiritual journey and your devotion. But then yes, you want to find time for meditation, you need to find time for yourself to disconnect. I guess every mother has to do that in their own way and many fathers also, they have the similar situation. One thing I'd like to say is if you can somehow create some sacred space in your morning, I know that might be difficult, but if you can, what we'd started experimenting with people is saying five to six in the morning you try and ring fence this time because usually the family isn't awake by that time it's quieter and in that time you do whatever helps you whether it be meditation study um, yoga breathing exercise spend some time just in those early morning hours and that really then helps you throughout your day. So that's definitely one thing you can do. The other thing is what we tend to do is compartmentalize our life and we say, this is the time in my life when I'm doing my duties. And this is the time in my life when I do my meditation. These are the days when I'm going to work and these are the days when I'm in uh, the temple or doing something spiritual. And we tend to compartmentalize. But what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is actually you can combine things. So for example, you need to spend time with your family, but you also need to time, spend time for your spirituality. So then why not spend spiritual time with your family? In other words, you can be with your children, but you can try and do something spiritual with them at that time. You need to find time to do exercise, but you need to find time to do something spiritual. So then what we tell people is go on a nature walk and chant the mantra while you're walking. Then you do both. You multiply your time. So try to, what we say, liberate two birds with one key rather than killing two birds with one stone. Um, try to see if you can combine things in your life. When you cook for your children, uh, when you offer that food then to the divine, to God, in a spirit of love, then not only are you feeding your children, but you're feeding God first. That's a spiritual activity. So the beauty of spirituality is that it can be incorporated in every aspect of life if we're um, ingenious. And, and in that way, you can do both things. Is that okay? Thank you. So I was uh, just now starting to read Bhagavad Gita. What is the best way to get started and get into uh, a regular study and embracing it in life? Yeah. I heard there's something called uh, Think Gita. <laughs> no, but yeah, I would say if you want to read Gita, there's a few important things. The first thing is you have to read regularly. Yeah, the first thing is you have to read regularly. In a beautiful verse, it said in Sanskrit, Maline Moshanam Pumsham Jalashnanam Dine Dine Gita Shakrit Bhashishnanam Samsara Malanashanam. In Sanskrit, it says, Jalashnanam Dine Dine. Every single day, you take a bath with water to cleanse your body. But in the same way, every single day, you should bathe your mind, your intellect, your consciousness in spiritual wisdom to cleanse all of the negativity and attachment and desire that goes on within us. So the first thing if you want to read the Gita is read it regularly, consistently. The second thing if you really want to get to the depths of the Gita is read it with others. Every day we're having conversations. So you've heard me say this before, small minds discuss events, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, but great minds discuss wisdom. So come together with others and discuss the Gita, ask your questions. Later on we'll tell you about a program we got going on called Think Gita Circles. 
So we're going to begin having these opportunities for 15 of you, 20 of you to come together and discuss. And it goes so much deeper. And the third thing is live the Gita. Take the knowledge and then try to use it to adjust and evolve and change the way you live in this world. And you'll see that the Gita is relevant to everything. And when you apply the Gita, then the knowledge of the Gita goes deeper. So those are the three things I would say. Read it regularly, read it in the company of others, and read it with a view to actually living it and informing how to um, you know, uplift and evolve your lifestyle. Thank you. Shall we go anonymous? Uh, okay, we got an anonymous one here, and then we'll go to the floor. Ask a monk about love. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try my best. So, one of the questions uh, says that we are told, told to love God and Krishna unconditionally. We hold all to Him, yet, how can um, some of us do that when we haven't um, experienced unconditional love ourselves? We've only experienced conditional love. How do we know how to give this to Krishna? Mm, so, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita talks about giving unconditional love um, but in this world we've only ever experienced conditioned love but remember this world and this life is just a chapter we're all originally pure spiritual living beings we all originally exist um, in a loving relationship with the Supreme so to love selflessly is at the core of our essence but it's just that we've forgotten it sometimes in this world someone goes through something called amnesia have you ever heard of amnesia sometimes they just wake up one day and they forget who they were where they were what they did but then gradually the memory comes back so to love unconditionally to want to live forever i don't know if anyone here ever liked oasis but Oasis, of course, they used to sing the Wonder Wall. But they also sung this song called I want to live forever, I want to love forever and live forever. So it, it's natural to all of us. All of us want to love. Look at all the songs in the charts. They're all about love. So actually to love is, is very natural for us, but it's just that right now we've forgotten and so when we chant the mantra, when we engage in acts of selflessness, um, then gradually that, that innate consciousness of selflessness will come. So, so yeah, just practice being a little more selfless every single day. Um, practice putting yourself um, second and putting others before you try to practice a little bit more of that every single day and gradually you'll see that that selflessness just grows and that selflessness is actually the happiest thing in the world have you ever noticed like at lunchtime if you just decide instead of eating to just like serve everyone else food then by the time everyone's eaten you're kind of like hmm I don't really feel that hungry anymore, you know, it was just so satisfying to serve. That, that's a good diet technique if you want to <laughs> try it out. Um, so there's a sense in that, that when you serve others, it's just like, wow, I, I just feel um, so satisfied. So yes, uh, although it feels very far, it's actually very, very natural. And by doing acts of selflessness, then we develop that selflessness. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, out here on the floor, someone has a question. Yes. Basically, we are here and suffering the cycle because of the cycle of birth and death because we have some accumulated 
past from my log for several nights. So my question, uh, and we are also trying to go back to Godhead by uh, you know, engaging ourselves, neither in good or bad karma, but a karma. Uh, so my fundamental question is, is that why were we born for the first time? Because when we were born for the first time, we neither had good or bad karma. Okay, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> So, okay, let me just rephrase, just to kind of give context to your question for everyone. So the question here is, uh, we all have karma. All of you are familiar with the principle of karma, right? What goes around, comes around. So the idea that we've performed acts in previous lives, and now we're experiencing certain things in this life as a consequence, yeah? Pretty simple, right? They said there's a new restaurant in town, it's called Karma, but there's no menu, you just get what you deserve. <laughs> right? So it's kind of like that. So, but then the question here comes as to why is it, where did all of that karma begin? Where did it, how did we get in here in the first place? How did we end up in this world? Why are we here? According to the Bhagavad Gita, we all exist in a pure relationship of love with the divine in the spiritual realm. However, in order for love to exist, there must be free will. So there's one thing that the divine gives to every single soul that the divine will never take away. And what is that? Free will. Because if there's no free will, then there's no love. In other words, every single soul has their own opportunity to make decisions about what they want to do, where they want to be, who they want to love. And so it's explained that a certain number of souls may decide and may have a curiosity to experience what life would be like outside of the divine realm. It's not that they're dissatisfied, it's not that they kind of had an argument with God or something, but it's just a curiosity. And what do they say? Curiosity killed the cat. So when they have that curiosity, then it's not that they're imprisoned within the spiritual world, like, no, nobody can leave here. This is like, you know, a high, high security Alcatraz, you know, and no one can escape. No because we're living in the spiritual realm because of free will. So if you want to leave the spiritual world, then there's the opportunity to do that. And so when that desire arises, then the souls descend into the material world. And here we go through a series of experiences, karmic reactions, uh, the cycle of birth and death. And at some point in our journey, we think, Maybe I'm not meant to be here. I want to be happy. I want to live forever. But here, there's always some problem. Here, everyone leaves. Everything's temporary. Maybe I'm not meant for this world. Maybe I'm meant for another world. And so at that point, then the soul begins looking at what there may be beyond this world. So... In answer to your question as to why we arrive here, it's because of free will. And it's because of free will that we ultimately go back. I hope that helps. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I can see many hands, so someone has to tell me because I otherwise get confused. Or whatever. Do we have something like that? And how important is it to have it? 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So is there some kind of ritual that you have to go through? Let me just backtrack a little bit and talk about religion in general. In this world we have different religions, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism. Religion comes from the Latin re, ligare. What does religion actually mean? Re means again, ligare means to connect. So religion is literally that thing which connects you back to the divine. Remember earlier today we talked about how every religion can bring you in contact with the divine. And the goal of every religion is the same. The goal of every religion is to learn to love God. So in different religions, we find different rituals. We find different uh, rites of passage. We find different ways in which uh, that religion is um, practiced and incorporated into life. And definitely within the spiritual tradition that we have, there are also rites of passage. When you are born, there's a rite of passage. Well, even before that, when you're conceived by the mother and father, there's a rite of passage. When you're born, there's a rite of passage. When you eat your first grain, there's a rite of passage. When you get married, there's a rite of passage. So there are different uh, ceremonies that are done throughout the soul's journey in this life. But it's not so important... Well, let me say it another way. The rituals and the ceremonies are only as important as they help you to ultimately awaken your love for God. What sometimes people do in this world is they perform a bunch of rituals, a bunch of ceremonies, but it doesn't actually help them to achieve the real goal of those ceremonies. Once a man was driving and he saw two guys on the side, and one, both of them had spades, and one was digging up a hole, throwing the dirt out, and the other one, with another spade, was picking up that dirt and putting it back in the hole. So he thought, that's a bit strange. This guy's taking it out, this guy's putting it in. So he drove back after an hour, and they were doing the same thing. One guy was picking it up, dig dishing it out, the other guy was putting it in. So he went over to them, he said, what are you guys doing? Because they said, we're planting trees. He said, but you're just uh, taking the dirt out and he's putting the dirt back in. And they said, yeah, the third guy who's with us, he puts the seed in, but he's off sick today. Oh. <laughs> he thought like, but they said, but the, the work must go on. We've got to do our job after all. Kind of thing, a lot of religion becomes like that. We do a lot of the rituals, we do a lot of the ceremonies, but is the seed the essence of it, the meaning. If you take a ritual and you add the spirit, then it becomes spiritual. But if you take the spirit out of it, then it's just a ritual. And rituals, though commendable, don't take you to ultimately satisfy the heart, which is looking for loving connection. So, Basically, yes. In answer to your question, yes. There are certain things you can do. And, um, but all of those things culminate in developing a consciousness and a connection and a relationship with the Divine. Is that okay? Can I say a few minutes? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm part of a few different forums. And then many people say, oh, we want to become Hindus. And people say, oh no, you don't have to do anything, you know, just follow the Hindu way of life. And these people, after a while, they lose interest. I think they need to have that thing to get into the religion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I yeah, I know, it's a very good point. Just to clarify that, when we teach the Bhagavad Gita, when we're teaching uh, this ancient wisdom which comes from India, sometimes we synonymously relate it to Hinduism. But it's important to clarify this, that actually you don't find the word Hindu within any of the Vedic literatures, actually. The Hindu, the word Hindu is a colonial term which kind of came along later on. Actually, what the Bhagavad Gita talks about is something called Sanatan Dharma. 
Sanatan means eternal and dharma you can say in different ways but we can say it means purpose or essence. So what we're actually teaching here is not any ism. It's not about joining an institution, it's not about joining a certain group or sectarian faith, but it's actually about awakening the deepest connection, purity of connection between the soul and the divine. And so in the world today, we tend to group ourselves by a lot of isms. And, um, but essentially, what the Bhagavad Gita is teaching goes beyond those boundaries. And therefore, interestingly, Krishna at the end of the Bhagavad Gita says, abandon all religion. You think like, wow, God's telling me to abandon all religion? Yeah. Krishna says, abandon all religion and get to the essence of it all, which is a loving connection with the divine. So, more than this ism or that ism or this group and that group, um, we should come here into this assembly, not because this is an ism or a group or an institution or it's we should come into this assembly because we feel here are the most sincere people trying to connect with the divine. And by being with them, it's going to help me as well. And that's the kind of community we want to create more than a sectarian community under a label. I hope that helps. Thank you so much for your... Wow, I don't think we'll have time for the second one. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yes, sorry, go ahead. The second question is related to decision making. So, do you have a framework of how to make right decisions? Because uh, oftentimes, uh, it's quite clear what is right and what's wrong, but many times you don't know. Uh, and the decision you make really actually kind of take your life to different parts. And your life is a combination of the decisions that you have today. Yeah. Wow, okay, two big questions. Okay, the first one, how do you find your purpose in life? In Sanskrit, purpose is known as dharma. Each of us in this room have two dharmas, two purposes. One purpose is called a svadharma, which means your purpose in this life, in this world. But each one of us also has a sanatan dharma, an eternal purpose, which is that we're spiritual beings and we're on a journey to try and get back to where we came from. So everyone in this world has a svadharma and a sanatan dharma. Just like the lady here has a svadharma to be a mother. That's her purpose in this world. But then simultaneously she's on a journey or her own spiritual journey to awaken pure love. So how do you find these two dharmas and how do you feed these two dharmas? That comes through first study, studying wisdom. The second thing is through introspection and understanding your own situation. And then the third thing is you actually find that purpose and live that purpose and yeah, awaken that purpose through application. So say for example, how do you find your svadharma? what you're meant to do in this world. Well, the first thing is read scriptures. They tell you there's different types of people. Different people have different abilities. They have different personalities. They have different um, contributions that they're meant to make to the world. One of the biggest problems in the world is we try to copy others, but everyone's unique. Some people are quiet, some people are loud, some people are short, and some people are tall. <laughs> know anyone like that? <laughs> Um, some people are meant to be monks, some people are meant to be entrepreneurs. Einstein said everyone is a genius, but if you convince a fish that it has to climb a tree, it will think its whole life thinking it's a failure. So each one of us have a svadharma, we have our own abilities. Some of you will be teachers, some of you will be entrepreneurs, as I said, some of you will be mothers, fathers, whatever it may be. So that you do through study, introspection, and application. 
And then your Sanatan Dharma, similarly, Krishna in the Gita will tell you how as a soul you can go on this journey and awaken your deeper nature and uh, how to fulfill that aspect of your purpose in this world. So yeah, purpose is such a huge thing and Dharma is basically the first word of the Gita, the final word of the Gita and something that is practically talked about in every single chapter of the Gita, Dharma, purpose. Yeah. And your second question about decision making. There's different levels of decision making. The lowest level of decision making is indecision. I can't make a decision. Know anyone like that? Just like, oh my God, like I don't know this, this, this. By the time the, this, the decision's gone, it's made for you. Right? So indecision, not good. Higher than indecision is impulsiveness. Know people like that? They just make a decision like that. Without thinking, what's the consequences? What's going to be the ramifications? That's not good. Higher than impulsiveness is introspection. Think deeply. If I make this decision, this is going to happen. If I make this decision, this is going to happen. That's better. But you want to know what's even better than that? Inspiration. When you take higher wisdom, which gives you principles of living, which you then take into your mind as inspiration, and then you introspect on that and then make a decision. That's exactly what Arjun did at the beginning of the Gita. Because what did he do? He went to Krishna and he said, Krishna, I don't have the answers. I'm confused. Inspire me, educate me, elevate my understanding. And then Krishna gave Arjun all this wisdom. And then Arjun thought about all that wisdom. And then he realized, this is what I'm meant to do in life. So what's the best model for decision making? Don't be indecisive. Don't even be impulsive. Don't even simply be introspective, but become inspired through gaining higher wisdom. And then introspect on that wisdom and make decisions. And then you'll make decisions which, uh, which will serve you to really move in a progressive way in your life. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard to make decisions. One man, he went to an astrologer and he said, I don't know if I, there's two ladies in my life. I don't know if I should marry the first one or the second one. I don't know which is going to be the lucky one. <laughs> so the, he looked into his uh, crystal ball and he said, oh, it's clear, it's clear. You're going to marry the first one and the second one will be the lucky one. So, uh, it's like this. Decisions are not so easy. So I have to make so many decisions. Who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, what kind of job you're going to do. And then you have to live with these decisions. Let me tell you something else about decisions. When you're making decisions, tip number one. Let your decisions not reflect your fears but let your decisions reflect your dreams. Tip number two, when you're making decisions, don't make decisions that will just please the people. Make decisions which will serve the people. Tip number three, when you're making decisions, don't just look at what public opinion is telling you, but listen to the internal calling. And tip number four, when you're making decisions, don't make the decisions which just feel good. Make the decisions which will create good. So if you do this... Thank you. I don't know how we do... I see the Kirtan team is here. How are we doing for time? Ten minutes? Okay, ten minutes. Yeah, uh, uh, are we going anonymous or? Yeah, let's go anonymous. They tend to be quite controversial. <laughs> no, um, so there's, there's a question here. Um, 
um, how can I stop people judging me for things that I've done in the past so I'm not defined by the past anymore? How can you stop uh, people judging you for things you've done in the past so that you're not defined by the past? Well, the first thing is we can't stop anyone from doing anything. That's the law of life. You can't force anyone to do anything. They say by the time you've grown up and realize that everything your parents said was right, your kids think you're wrong. (laughs) Isn't it? You can't... We can't control other people. People act in irrational ways, people misjudge us. How many of you in your life have been misjudged by someone? All of us have been misjudged. We should take the opinions of people in our life, we should not take their opinions equally. When there are people in your life who know you, who love you, and who have the spiritual knowledge to be able to help you, you should take the energy from them in a serious way. And the energy from the people in your life who don't know you, who don't necessarily have your best wishes at heart, and who don't really have the spiritual vision to be able to really uplift you, why would you allow them to impede your journey? Try in your life to surround yourself with people who understand you and people who are genuinely adding positive energy in your life and people who genuinely want to, uh, uh, are going on their spiritual journey and can help you. The problem in our life is we hold on to toxic relationships, you see. It's amazing, in the Bhagavad Gita, we can look at it in different ways. But a general flow of the Gita is the first six chapters, the middle six chapters, and the final six chapters. The first six chapters are all about Karma Yoga, the middle six chapters are all about Bhakti Yoga, and the final six chapters are all about Jnana Yoga. But if we were to say this in modern terminology, the first six chapters are about how to live, The second chapters, six chapters, are all about how to love. And the final six chapters are all about how to let go. Let go of attachments. Let go of situations. Let go of relationships in your life that no longer serve you. Because a lot of the problem is we're carrying such a heavy burden in this world because we don't know how to let go. And so, if there are relationships like that in your life, maybe it's just a matter of learning to let them go. And if you can't let them go for some reason, at least don't let those relationships define you. Thank you. Uh, Maybe it's the last question now. So whoever's got the mic, I see certain hands. Okay, you get the last question. Yes. I'm just a bit confused about the trauma nowadays because I've got this respect for the whole institution. We have three programs on Sundays and Fridays. I don't have to like, balance myself. It's time for you to go to. I'm a bit confused. Oh, okay, so you're saying which place you should go to, because, yeah. Yeah, there are many options on a Sunday. (laughs) There's also, like, cricket, football, there's a lot of things you, there's a lot, Sunday's a busy day, it's the day of rest, yeah. So, but, but, see, it's like this, it's like this. In your life, you have limited time. You have to make decisions. You have to ask yourself. You see, one of the biggest problems in life is we invest time and energy in things that don't serve our purpose. Things that are not going to bring us to the place we want to go to. 
things that, you know, we've been doing maybe by tradition or by default, by habit. In time management, don't just think about how you can put more things into your life, but also start thinking about what you can let go that may not help you. So each person, whether it's a choice between different spiritual paths or whether it's a choice between different activities of the world, each of us have to realize that there are some things we're going to have to let go of. Because if you try to fit everything in, by default, something will get missed out. So rather than doing that, consciously ask yourself, um, where am I finding spiritual connection? Where am I finding positive spiritual company that will allow me to grow? Where am I finding um, growth in my journey? Where am I actually finding genuine connection? And then we should pursue that. Because sometimes what we do in life is we just go along with how we've always done things. They say the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. So let us be very conscious of our time. Let us be very mindful and very deliberate about where we're spending time because time is limited and time goes fast and before you know it, life has progressed and then we look back and think, where did I spend my time? And we may have regrets. So, ultimately, you have to make a decision and, uh, and try to make that decision based on what is going to give you the most growth and take you towards your ultimate aspiration and goal in life.